I started asking for um, where, how can I get a hold of her? Big mistake, especially with somebody like with my name. So uh, when I finally contacted and this gentleman answered, it was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you a little bit about Stacy. He has been in Lakeland his entire 48 years. He graduated from Lake Gibson High School and was hired by the city parks at the age of 17. He worked with Stephen Rosas as an assistant and became Lakeland's new Rose Guy and maintained the city's Rose Gardens. He recalls Bill Murlock, the superintendent of parks at that time, who was a serious Rose enthusiast, and he said that there were roses everywhere. Over the years, Stacy has worked with the landscape crew, grounds maintenance crew, became an arborist while working with the tree crew, and finally became the foreman for Hollis Garden where he has worked for 18 years. When I saw Stacy today, I realized that I had met Stacy when our Leadership Lakeland class had a tour of the Hollis Garden. And I just remember all the great things, all the stories he told, that he is a storyteller. Um, he calls himself a self-proclaimed plant nerd <laughs> and is not ashamed to, to, of it. After doing and giving many garden tours, he has developed a tour about the most mysterious location in town, the Lake Mirror Park and the Francis Langford Promenade. It took five years to gather the historical information and understand what it truly was. The history, of course, led to other interesting facts about his hometown. He is still trying to piece it all together after five years of study and research, and he is going to share some of that with you today. There's also brochures on the table because he does the historical tours. And please feel free to take one home. And if there's not enough at the table, I have more up here. While the botanical world will always be Stacy's true calling, history has become very important to him. And he feels he has become more a part of it every day. Please welcome Stacy Smith, our Rose Guy. Like this. <laughs> um, Think once. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm not used to doing crowds quite like this, so if I flub up, you know, give me, be patient with me. But I'm going to try to tell you something maybe you don't know about this town. And um, uh, you know, the, the nighttime historic tour that I give. Uh, kind of developed from the garden tour, Paul's Garden, because people would come in the garden over the years and they would they would point to the Lake Mirror Promenade and say, what is that? When I first started at Paul's Garden, I had no idea. So I started digging. And the uh, thing about history and digging it all up is you, you find other things that maybe you didn't know about. So hopefully this will reflect that. Uh, I'm gonna try to show you today how Lakeland fit in with the rest of the world um, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. The two sides of town. Uh, if anyone has ever lived in Lakeland for any length of time, you know that there's a north side and a south side. And the people that live in, on the north side and the people that live on the south side, they know that. They know the two distinct sides of town. That goes all the way back to the beginning. Now, in this picture, uh, I have the Trammell brothers. The Trammell brothers moved to Lakeland in 1881, and uh, they purchased the property from the United States government. Uh, and it was the property over on Lake Wire. It extended all the way north to where the hospital is currently located. Uh, that was where the railroad yard was eventually put. And um, that is where Lakeland existed at that time. In 1883, they started the incorporation process to make Lakeland an official town. And we were officially Lakeland on January 1st of 1885. Only it was located on Lake Wire. 
Now, while this was going on, uh, there were some other people up in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, one night playing a game of cribbage. And during that game, Abraham Munn looked to his uh, brother-in-law, Mr. Morton, and said, well, I was able to purchase 80 acres of land in Florida today. And I got my, my acreage for $5 an acre. Well, Mr. Morton, on the other side of the table, said, well, I purchased some land today, too. It happened to be right next to yours. Only I purchased mine for 91 cents an acre. <laughs> These two fellows were businessmen, and Mr. Munn could not be outdone. So he decided he was going to do something with his property. And he invested $50,000 of his own money in 1885 to, to develop his property into a town. There was a problem. Lakeland didn't exist downtown where it is now. It was on the Trammell property. Now, the fellow that was working on the railroad at the time, he was a foreman of the railroad project, the one that connected the village of Tampa to the town of Kissimmee. Uh, his name was uh, Herbert Jackson Drain, and he was a fellow Kentuckian. He knew Abraham Munn, he knew John Morgan. And eventually, he would introduce Abraham Munn to Henry Plant, who was building the railroad. Henry Plant, uh, started coming to Florida prior to Lakeland being constructed or being formed uh, because of his wife. His wife had tuberculosis. He was originally from New Jersey and uh, they thought the air in Florida would be better for her breed so they would stay up in Jacksonville and this is again prior to Lakeland. Uh, he met Henry, Mr. Adams of the Adams Express Company while he was staying in Jacksonville. Mr. Adams was building railroads all over the southeast of the United States but the Civil War was about to break out, and Mr. Adams didn't want his holdings south of the Mason-Dixon line to fall into Confederate hands. So he sold those holdings to Henry Plant, who apparently had enough money to purchase them. And uh, Mr. Plant's wife passed away, and uh, the war broke out, and Mr. Plant went to Europe during the war. He came back after the war was over, and that's when he started building railroads in, in Florida and the southeast. There was a seven month charter to construct our railroad that runs through Lakeland. And without that railroad, we would not exist. Wherever that train was going to stop, that's where the town was going to be located. And they finished just a few hours before the charter was up. Now, Mr. Munn had purchased his property without seeing it. So his only relative that was living in Florida in the 1880s was his son Morris. And Mr. Morris, or Morris Munn was working for the Board of Trade over in the land of Florida. So in order, this is prior to the railroad being constructed, in order for Abraham's son to get here from the land of Florida, he had to catch a river steamboat and take it north to Jacksonville. Uh, he, when he arrived in Jacksonville, he boarded what was called a narrow gauge railroad that took him across the state of Florida to the island of Cedar Key. When he arrived in Cedar Key, he boarded the Lizzie Henderson, which was an ocean steamboat in those days, a very famous one. That took him south to the village of Tampa. When he arrived in Tampa, that's where he met the postman who had a horse and buggy. And they took that horse and buggy from Tampa all the way to Bartow, which is our county seat. That's where he met the county surveyor. And somehow they made their way up to the Mon property to locate it. So he had to go halfway across the United States just to get here from the other side of Orlando at that time. <laughs> uh, once, once they located the property, Mr. Munn sent his other son, Samuel, down to plat it out. And Samuel had just graduated from MIT. Um, he was a sickly young, young person, though, and he passed away in 1892, just about seven years after Lakeland was formed. And uh, after the railroad project was finally finished, Herbert Jackson Drain decided to stay here upon him. Henry Plant encouraged him to stay here because Henry Plant said this town was going to develop. And uh, so he opened up our first drugstore. It was called the, the SNL and H, HL Drain Drugstore. Now, I've got a close up shot of this picture. And you can see just above the sign that there's also an office for this the Southern Express Railroad, railroad Company there, and um, that was Henry Plant's railroad company. You're gonna have to remember that a little bit later once we get further into this. This, this just kind of shows you how everything gets connected. And that brings us to our clash. Now, 
the Trammell family had established Lakeland. They had incorporated it, and they had set up a temporary train depot on their property over by Lake Wire. And that was where the town was going to be. But him, Mr. Mr. Mom came to Florida and was introduced to Henry Plant, Barbara or Jackson Drain. And the deal was between Mr. Drain or Mr. Drain or Mr. Munn and Mr. Uh, Plant, the deal was if you stop on my property, this is Munn talking, I will give you all kinds of right away. I'll give you a, a really nice train depot. I'll do all these things for you. Mr. Plant, being a businessman, said, well, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And again, wherever that train stopped, that's where the town was going to exist. So that deal was made, and the town moved from the Trammell property, which was primarily north of the railroad tracks, to the Munn property, which was primarily south of the railroad tracks. Now, our first mayor was John Washington Trammell, the fellow on the, on the right-hand side. Um, he was only mayor for 50 days. He stepped out in protest because he lost his town. And that's, for those of you that have lived in Lakeland for any length of time, that's when the feuding began between those north side farmers <laughs> and those south side rich snobby people. <laughs> that still exists. It's a friendly rivalry these days, but it goes all the way back to 1885 and that deal. It was made by, by uh, Mr. Munn and Mr. Uh, Plant. And uh, down on the right hand corner, you can see that first train depot that uh, Abraham Munn built on the north end of what is now Munn Park. It was a city park back then. And uh, that was the first building in town to burn down. That, that feuding was pretty serious in those days. So that's, that's how we started. It began with a feud. Now, I want to talk about the neighboring town of Acton, Florida, which was our rival town. Now, Acton, Florida existed between Lake Parker and Lake Bonnie on the east side of town. And they only existed for five years. Most of the people that lived in Acton, Florida were British. It was a European settlement. And their economy was gonna be based on citrus. They were waiting for that railroad to be finished and they were gonna start shipping citrus all over the United States and Canada. Um, there was a Prussian count that lived in their midst. And his name was Count Bernstorff, Count Friedrich Wilhelm Bernstorff. And he was kind of a shadowy figure in our history. Now, when Acton was forming, something happened in 1883 on the other side of the planet. It was a volcanic explosion out in the Pacific Ocean. The island of Krakatoa exploded so big, sent so much debris and ash up into our atmosphere. It, 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 it clouded our planet and cooled us down for several years. So when that exploded in 1883, two years later, on this side of the planet, we had the great freeze of 1885, 1886. And that wiped out all of the citrus in Acton, Florida and destroyed their economy. So it wasn't long after that they became a ghost town. That's, there's very few pictures of that town that exists. And that again is the area between Lake Parker and Lake Bonham. Now the Count, when Acton fell apart, was one of the few people that decided to come to Lake Park. And he settled on Lake Collinsworth. Um, we, again, we don't know an awful lot about him. And I did contact the royal family in Denmark. It's a, it's a Danish royal family, the Berenstorfs, but uh, they never sent me any information. So. I just going to keep digging on that one. Uh, when he moved to Lake Hollingsworth, he decided to open up a nursery. And uh, his property was probably where Florida Southern College is now. And uh, because the city ended up with that property in a very mysterious way. They just all of a sudden it was the city's property and then they sold it to uh, uh, Florida Southern when they finally came down. But there's a picture of Mr. Baron Schwartz Nursery and his property. And again, there's more proof that he was here. Now this, some of these pictures have come from England because a lot of those Englishmen took that stuff home with them. So our history is located all over the United States and all over the world. And that's why it's so hard to dig up the early days. It's scattered all over the place. Now, if we go forward to after the turn of the century, Mr. Bernstorff had a, a much more famous either cousin or nephew 
and his name was Count Johann Heinrich von Bernstorff. He was the Prussian ambassador to the United States in the teens. And um, of course, he was involved with the Kaiser and the sinking of the Lusitania. But what a lot of people didn't know at that time is the Lusitania had munitions in the bottom of the ship. We were sending munitions to England to help them fight the war over in Europe. So the Germans sank it. And uh, Woodrow Wilson, you know, he kind of had his hands full. He had to do something about the Prussian count you know, in Washington, D.C., but he didn't know quite how to handle it at that time. So a few other things happened. Uh, one was the Zimmer, Zimmerman telegram. It was, a, it was a coded message that was sent from the Kaiser to Mexico. <coughs> Only the United States intercepted that telegram and decoded it and, and found out, and of course, Bernstorff's name is on the bottom of it, they found out that uh, you know, Germany was working with Mexico. Mexico was to keep us busy over here while the war was taking place in Europe. And uh, again, there's some old cartoons from those days. Then another, then another thing happened. There's an island off the coast of New Jersey it's called Black Tom Island. And right across from it is the Statue of Liberty. Well, this is where the United States was keeping all the munitions that they were sending to England for the war effort. And one of Bernstorff's people that was working with him used something that was called a pencil bomb. Now, it wasn't an explosive device, and it was kind of long and shaped like a pencil, but at a certain you could time it. You could place it somewhere, and at a certain time it would go off, and it would create flames. Well, if you put pencil bombs on an island loaded with munitions, you got a problem. It was known as the Black Tom Explosion, and it did kill 50 people. And that was kind of the last straw with Woodrow Wilson. After that, Bernstorff, the Prussian ambassador to the United States, had to go. And here are pictures of Black Tom Island after the explosion. It was so strong that it sent shrapnel across the bay that it embedded into the Statue of Liberty. And uh, this is the moving van that moved uh, Count Bernstorff out of the, the Prussian embassy in Washington. There's an interesting thing about that moving van, though, and this, this, this again shows you how things are connected. You can see that it's done by the Southern Express Railroad Company, which was Henry Plant's railroad company. He's the one that moved the Prussian ambassador out. Now, another fellow that lived in Acton, Florida, prior to Acton becoming a ghost town, was the banker. His name was Lobertus Johannes Jacobus Neuvenkopf. <laughs> And uh, uh, that his profession was banking. He established the first bank in Polk County, which was located, located right across from the Lake Near Tower behind Frescoes. That's where it was located. And we know that he backed up his money with silver and gold because he wrote a book about it that was called Bimetallism and the Highway of Nature. And the old bimetallism system was the silver and gold standard that we had here in the United States prior to us going to the gold standard. Now we have a credit form of, 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 of money. And uh, if we go to after the turn of the century, um, there was an auditorium that was located on Lake Mirror, uh, where the Wolfson sculpture is currently located. It was known as the Chautauqua Auditorium, which was a kind of a religious thing. The first Chautauqua that came to Lakeland was 1911. They set up a large tent on the north shore of Lake Morton, and the whole town went to the Chautauqua, and different ministers would speak at that Chautauqua, and then after a week or so, that Chautauqua would move on to the next town. Well, the first one that came left an impression on Lakelanders, so they built an auditorium for it, uh, for it to come to the following year, and that auditorium opened just in time in 1912. And after, after its opening, a famous peeper, uh, speaker came to Lakeland. His name was William Jennings Bryan. He was, he was known for his cross of gold speech that he gave in Chicago in the 1800s, where he held out his arms at the end of the speech and said, you will not crucify me on the cross of gold, because he, like our banker, was 
you know, a proponent of that bimetallism system. He wanted to keep that, that silver and gold system alive here in the United States. The reason that it, it kind of went away, though, was the wealthy businessmen up in the Northeast during those days were trading with England, and England had the gold standard. So it made trading a little bit difficult. They had to convert everything. So there was a big push for the United States to go to that gold standard. But after Mr. Bryan's speech, they picked him up and carried him around the room encouraged him to run for president of the United States. He ran against William McKinley, and we all know what happened. We went to the gold standard. And, uh, here, here he is portrayed as a lion. But this was such an important thing in those days, and you don't hear much about it these days. A lot of people don't know what bimetallism is, but it was a major issue in the late 1800s. So much so that uh, someone decided to put it into a children's tale so we would never forget. His name was Frank, Frank Baum, and the story was The Wizard of Oz. Now, you have to think about this. The main character in The Wizard of Oz is Dorothy. And she gets swept up into this monetary whirlwind that I'm talking about. And she gets deposited into a new world. Well, when she comes out of that house, once it finally lands in that new place, she discovers that she's accidentally killed someone. That was the Wicked Witch. Now, in the original story that was published in 1900, the Wicked Witch did not have ruby slippers. They changed that for the movie in 1939 because it was one of our early color movies and they just wanted a little more color in it. Originally, the Wicked Witch wore silver slippers. And when Dorothy comes out of the house and meets the common people of the land uh, and tells her what her problem is, you know, I'm Dorothy, I need to get back home to Kansas. They say, well, if you want to go home to Kansas, you need to put on those silver slippers, and you need to follow the yellow brick road. So there's your silver and gold standard. And along the way, Dorothy met more people of the land. Uh, the scarecrow represented the politicians, or not the politicians, the scarecrow represented farm, the farmers. Uh, the, the tin woodman represented the industry, and the cowardly lion represented the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and what they were doing, <laughs> what they were doing, there was, they were forming a coalition, and they were going to take their, their case to the Wizard of Oz. Now, Oz is spelled O-Z, which is an abbreviation for ounce, which is how you measure precious metals. So... That's where my story ends, but it shows you how we were kind of connected to all of those things in, in odd, odd ways. You know, we had the Prussian count here in Lakeland and later on one in Washington, D.C. So again, this is an example. If, if, you dig, if you dig enough, you find more connections to other things. And uh, I hope if you haven't been on the historic tour of Lake Mira, I hope you come one day. There's some, some brochures again on your table. It's a free tour. It's a long tour, it's an hour and a half, and I have to do it at nighttime. But uh, I explain all of the history around Lake Mirror and everything that happened there. So thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, and just to uh, kind of bring the story full circle, 
uh, Beth has been texting me throughout Stacy's program. Um, our own Steve Moore's uh, great grandfather was Herbert Green, and then uh, he uh, it says additionally both his great grandfather Herbert J. Dr Herbert J. Drain and his grandfather William S. Moore were charter members of the Lakeland Rotary Club. So the history runs deep here, people.